Today we're going to be talking about how video works on a DSLR, why it's different, and understanding the differences so that you can create great video. Did you bring an apple for the teacher? It's HDSLR 101. This episode is made possible by CPM Film Tools, your lightweight solution for caging the beast. LCD Viewfinder, the essential accessory for DSLR video. Lightcraft Workshop, the perfect tools to create the perfect image. Manhattan LCD, the affordable solution for high definition monitoring. Hi, my name is Tony Rialli from NextWaveDV.com. Today we're going to show you the differences in shooting video on HDSLRs. You might get a little scared um, just grabbing a DSLR camera and thinking, okay, I'm going to shoot video on this and not understanding anything of the normal structuring that you were used to on your video camera. So we're going to try and uh, get you up to speed on how to do it so that you can create great looking video and not have to be scared off by all the different functions that you're going to find on your HDSLR camera. All right, the first thing we want to talk about is ISO versus gain. ISO, if you've ever shot film, you'll know that uh, that was the sensitivity of the film to light. As we went into digital, uh, we were able to dial in the specific ISO and not have to be limited to one specific one. Uh, but the, as technology improved, as things progressed, uh, ISO ranges increased higher and higher in number, which simply meant that you were able to have better light sensitivity so you're able to uh, shoot in lower light situations. Uh, typically most video cameras have a native ISO. Uh, for example, the HVX200 is, is considered to have around a 600 ISO rating. Um, so in order to get a higher light sensitivity, you use gain. Well, there's really no gain in HDSLR. You just change your ISO. And as you increase your ISO, you may get to a point where you might start seeing grain in it. For example, on a uh, 5D Mark II, you can shoot at 1600 ISO for HD video and be relatively grain free. Uh, if you start going higher than that, you might start seeing grain in your image. Now, the great thing is with most HDSLRs, um, even the highest ISO setting is typically better than the gain settings on most uh, professional grade HD video cameras. Uh, so you're not going to find anywhere that says gain, you're just going to use your ISO to ch change your uh, sensitivity for your camera. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is f-stop versus exposure, which is essentially the same thing. But if you've ever shot a HD video camera, you'll know that you'll change your exposure. If you're in a darker room, you might open up your iris. If you're in a brighter room or outside, you might close your iris down. Um, and this will, in a sense, change your f-stop number back and forth. But the thing is, when you're shooting on a one-third inch chip, uh, typically you're not going to get very, uh, ch very much change in your shallowness of depth of field. Because it's a smaller sensor, you're just simply changing your exposure and your, your shallowness of depth of field does not change dramatically. Um, now, when you're shooting on HDSLR, that can change major. If you're shooting at f1.8 on an HD camera, and stop down to f5.6, you might not notice that much different. But if you're shooting on a 5D Mark II or 7D or whatever, and you shoot at f1.8 versus f5.6, you're gonna notice a major difference because you have a larger sensor and you're gonna obviously get that shallower depth of field that we talked about earlier. Now, this is important because as we talked about in our first episode, uh, shallowness of depth of field or, or having wide depth of field, uh, this is an artistic choice. So you should really use your f-stop as a way to set your exposure, but also a way to choose that, uh, how shallow your depth of field should be in making that artistic choice. Use other settings like your ISO, um, relighting a scene, maybe using ND filters if you're outside to be able to stop the camera down and reduce the light input, but still having that shallow depth of field and leaving your iris wide open. One thing you might be used to when shooting on a professional grade video camera is having a built-in ND filter. Of course, this is something that doesn't come standard in most lenses, um, so this is something that you would have to purchase separately. Uh, we will discuss ND filters later on, but just so you know, um, if you are wanting to stop down your light, you're going to have to get an ND filter. You're not going to find one built into your camera. All right, shutter speed is kind of a tricky thing. Um, shutter speed in photography is something that you shoot. Uh, you can change the shutter speed anywhere from, you know, uh, 
couple seconds shutter speed to one five thousandth of a second if you're shooting outside and you need it to be really quick. You, this is something that photographers are used to going back and forth. When you're shooting video, it changes your aesthetic dramatically and sometimes in a bad way if you change your shutter speed. Typically, there's a rule, they call it the rule of 180, where you want to leave your, have your shutter speed be twice the frame rate that you're shooting at. So if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, you should have your shutter speed set at 1 60th of a second. If you're shooting at 24 frames per second, you would have it set at 1 48th of a second. Now, most HDSLRs don't have 50th or 48th of a second as an option, so you can just use 1 50th of a second to be able to accomplish an almost an identical look. Um, now, the issue is if you shoot at a faster shutter speed in order to say you're outside and you got way too much light and you still want to have shallow depth of field, but you say, okay, I'm going to shoot at a faster shutter speed. Well, now you're going to get a staccato look, which you don't get the normal film look when you have that rule of 180 that you're following, um, which is the double shutter speed. Uh, if you shoot at like 1 500th or 1 800th of a second or something like that, you're going to get this odd staccato look, which will not look filmic. And honestly, with the whole point of using these cameras is you're getting a filmic look. So you want to obey that rule of 180, that shutter speed, so if you're shooting again at 1 30th, shoot at 1 60th, and if you need to stop your camera down, either adjust your f-stop or turn your ISO down or use ND filters. And we will talk about ND filters later when we get to lenses, uh, but this is how you want to change your exposure. Don't crank up your shutter speed because you will change the look. Now, if you do want to have that look, uh, this is a look that was made popular in movies like Saving Private Ryan, um, or sometimes you'll see a lot in action scenes where they don't want to have a lot of motion blur. Um, so they will shoot at a, a faster shutter speed and you kind of get a, an intense feeling. So if you're shooting this outside, a nice drama it, and, and you know, a nice emotional scene, it really wouldn't make sense. But if you're shooting an action scene, higher shutter speeds can be used. I've used them for action scenes um, and it can be a, a, a form that you use. So just use it again as an artistic choice, but not just something that you automatically set on, as an auto on your camera. All right, now say you're shooting in an office situation with fluorescent bulbs up high in the ceiling. Now, you're going to run into an issue with the electrical ballast creating a certain frequency uh, that can cause an odd strobing in your camera if you're not in sync with that uh, refresh rate of the fluorescent bulb. This is where you want to shoot at the correct uh, shutter speed in relation to the uh, country that you're in. For example, if you're in the United States, you're typically working with a 60 hertz um, refresh rate and if you're in um, uh, UK or overseas you might be working with a 50 Hertz you want to have your shutter speed be identical to the uh, whatever the rating is for your country so that you don't get an odd strobing effect um, and and the, the, the other way to get around this is to use higher power ballasts that are used for video production that's where if you like get a Kino flow or cool lights or something like that the, the higher end video fluorescent lights, you're not going to get that problem because these are higher frequency electrical ballasts that don't have that strobing. But if you're using standard ballasts in an office situation, you want to make sure that you're using the correct shutter speed um, in order to get to, to reduce any strobing effect that you might get. White balance is an important thing to be setting correctly on your camera. Um, this may be something that you're used to possibly using a white card for, um, and that is a setting that most of the HDSLR cameras will let you do. You can set a manual white balance. Um, you can also select specific white balances that are related to your uh, tungsten or daylight or fluorescent or whatever situation that you may be in. Um, and then the, some of the higher end DSLRs like the 70 and the 5D Mark II will let you dial in a specific uh, Kelvin range. Light is measured in Kelvins, um, so daylight would be around 5600 Kelvin, tungsten light would be around 3200 Kelvin, and so on and so forth. If you're using video lights, they're usually calibrated for a specific range. If you're using non-video lights, you might want to use a white card to balance to the correct situation. But again, white balancing is a very important step, and if you forget this step, you can create some, some really bad looking images. If you're coming from photography and coming into video and you're used to shooting raw, you might think, you might not even set your white balance. You might either let it go to auto or you might just do it all in post. So this is an important step. If you're shooting video, you have to get your white balance correct in the camera because you're going to forget white information and color information. And if you try to go back and fix it later, there might not be enough color information to work with. Now, one form of technique to remember, um, especially if you're used to rolling on tape 
um, or if you're used to whatever format that you might be used to, to shooting on, is to just simply give yourself additional time when you're rolling your camera. Um, you want to start the camera before the talent starts talking. You want to stop the camera after you've given yourself enough pause. For example, if you want to fade out, if you want to crossfade, if you just need an extra, uh, say the, the music is under, uh, the underbed of the music is playing and it needs to draw out a little bit longer before it cuts out, just remember to give yourself extra time. The nice thing about shooting solid state is that you're not chewing up tape or anything like that. You're just being able to hit the start and stop. But it can be a habit to just, when you're done, you immediately hit the stop button and now you're wishing that you had just a couple extra seconds to work with in post. All right, most of the things you're going to be shooting with your HDSLRs are going to be in high definition. But if, say, you have a client coming to you and saying, I would really love to have something in standard definition, uh, this is something that you need to realize. Standard def on a video camera is recorded differently than standard def on an HDSLR. HDSLR is usually at 640 by 480, which is your VGA resolution, which is fine for online use. But if you're going to television, Standard definition is typically 720 by 480 using a 0.9 pixel aspect ratio. Or if you're shooting uh, for widescreen, and you, uh, that previous one was full screen, widescreen would be 720 by 480 at a 1.2 pixel aspect ratio. This is something that your camera handles and it knows how to do it, uh, but this is not something that your HDSLR would know how to handle and, and know how to do. So if you're going to shoot standard definition, it's usually recommended that you shoot in high def and either crop it or drop it down to a lower resolution in post. Now sound is something that we're going to cover in an entire episode later on, but I want to address it really quickly here. If you're used to using a video camera with an onboard mic, uh, or even a camera with XLR inputs, sound has been something that's more kind of maybe an afterthought. You just know to set it on your camera and go. Sound on a video DSLR is very, very different. Um, you typically, the onboard recording, uh, the little mic that's on there, if it has one, is not very good. Um, and then if you have a sound input jack on your camera, uh, it may have a only be able to set to auto, so your levels are going to go everywhere depending on how loud it is in the scene. So usually, you, most audio engineers would tell you never to set it auto, always set it to manual and adjust your levels accordingly. Um, another situation that you can run into is the bit rate that the audio is recording at. If it's recording too low, you might not have a high enough quality to work with in post later on. So most people choose to either use a XLR converter that can plug in uh, a mic into their camera uh, or use a separate device for recording audio. Again, we're going to discuss this later when we do the whole sound episode, but it's something to note that sound is, of course, half of your video. If without sound, you know, you're just doing uh, visual shots. So you want to make sure that you're covering your sound base well and that you have the proper equipment to shoot sound correctly. Well, we hope that that helps you be able to understand how to pick up an HDSLR and just learn the, some of the differences from a normal video camera or from going from photography and learning how to just take the video functions and shoot. If you'd like to find out more about our HDSLR training series, go to nextwavedv.com. You'll find out all of our previous episodes, and you'll continue to see each episode released every other week. Uh, we have a 12-episode series, and you'll see them continuing to be released. If you are really excited and you'd like to see everything right away, you can go onto our website, click on the product section, and you'll be taken to our store where you can purchase HDSLR 101, the entire series, for only $20. Uh, this does help us uh, continue to offer free resources to you, so we always appreciate when you're willing to check out our products and purchase them. You can also check out some of our other great resources, such as our Next Wave Tracks, royalty-free music. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.